But this morning, we're continuing to look at Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And I read a neat description of the book of Ephesians this week, and it compared uh, Ephesians to the London Eye. Compares Ephesians to the London Eye. Uh, uh, we went on the London Eye with the children uh, probably about 15 years ago or so. Uh, who else has been on the London Eye? <laughs> yeah, probably quite a number of us. And uh, it's quite a, it's, it's a great experience. Mm. So uh, you're up there in your capsule and you get a, a great panoramic view. You can see the River Thames uh, stretching into the distance. Mm. And then you get a panoramic, panoramic view of the Houses of Parliament. You look north and you can see Wembley Arch. You turn around, you look south and you can see Crystal Palace in the, di in the distance. And uh, now Ephesians 2, this offers us a, a great bird's eye view of some of the really great foundational biblical themes. Yeah? So God, the world, Jesus, the church, etc. etc. So uh, it, it takes half an hour to do a full circle. So I assure you, we're just going to be here for a half hour today, <laughs> uh, unless we get stuck at the top. Yeah? Oh, Carol's timing me. <laughs> You're timing me. So uh, settle into your capsule and uh, let's go around. I'm actually going to speak from part of the passage that Justin covered last week. And this is deliberate. I thought the passage last week, Ephesians chapter 2, it's such a rich passage that it really deserved another look at. So that's where we're going this morning. Now, our passage is going to come up on the screen. I shall just discreetly move to one side. There we go. There we go. Now, Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Should we just read this together? Um, so here we go. So then, so then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So, so through the work of Christ, the, the division between Jew and Gentile has been broken down. And we Gentiles, we are our fellow citizens with God's people. Jesus has abolished the regulations of the ceremonial law and the condemnation of the moral law. Jewish believers and Gentile believers make up one united body, the church. This is kind of a recap of where we've been over the last week or so. And Justin encouraged us last week that, that Jews and Gentiles now have a shared history. We read the Old Testament covenants and the prophet, prophecies about Christ through a new lens. In our passage, Paul uses three metaphors to describe the church. And I wonder, did you spot, did you spot the three metaphors that, uh, that, that are used? Uh, do you want to, uh, well, the, okay, the, the first metaphor is that the church is, it's a household. Uh, the church is a household. Mm -hmm. We are one family with God, the Father as our head. Secondly, the church is a building. Church is a building, yes, spot on, Carol. The church is a building. It's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets and with Christ mm -hmm. as the chief cornerstone. And then thirdly, the one I'm going to focus on from this morning, the church is a... Holy the church is... Yeah, well done, yes. Well done. The, the church is a holy temple. It's a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So let's explore the theme of temple and the presence of God this morning. When I mention the word temple, I wonder what comes to mind for you. So maybe you think of ancient ruins such as the Parthenon. And here we've got a picture of the Parthenon. It's on the site of the Acropolis in Athens. I went to Athens on a school trip way back, way back in 1977. And one of the highlights of that was it was a trip to the Acropolis. And that's one of the... Um, that's one of the structures on the site of the Acropolis, the Parthenon. Maybe you think of places in England like Audley End House near South and Walden, which has it has the Temple of Concord in its grounds, and uh, 
that's uh, that, that's Eden, yeah. But uh, can we can we go back one? <laughs> oh, there, there we go, there we go. So that's uh, uh, Audley End House uh, near Sampton Wall, and that's that's the Temple of Concord, which which are in its grounds. <clears throat> the word temple would have resonated very strongly with the believers in Ephesus, because uh, the temple of the goddess of Artemis dominated the city of Ephesus. It was a huge marble structure, and in, in its inner shrine was a statue to the goddess Artemis. Now the temple no longer exists, but in its day it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Justin explained to us last week that covenant is a theme that runs all the way through scripture and it provides a backbone for our, for our redemption story. Temple and the presence of God, this, these are also themes that run all the way through scripture. And uh, uh, these are themes which are rich in spiritual significance. So I want, to, I want to walk you through five key instances where a temple appears in the scripture. And the first place where a temple appears is all the way back in Genesis 1, creation itself. And uh, we've, got, we've got a picture of... Um, so it, it now, yes, so, so creation itself, I, I would put to you, is, is the first temple that appears in scripture. In ancient Near Eastern culture, Genesis chapter 1 would have been understood as an account of the building of a temple building. Temples were understood to be the dwelling or the resting place of the God who was worshipped there. And in the Genesis, Genesis account, on the seventh day of creation, what did God do? God rested, or he took up residence in his creation. Genesis chapter 2 describes God planting the Garden of Eden and God putting Adam there to work it and to take care of it. So God had, God had created the cosmos and then he hadn't gone off outside the cosmos. God, God, was, God was in his creation. He was, uh, he, he was there, he created Adam, uh, put Adam in the garden to, to work it, to tend the garden. And Genesis 3.8 describes God as walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So creation, and in particular the Garden of Eden, was the first temple. And the theme of temple and the presence of God grows more and more throughout Scripture. The second temple that appears in Scripture is the tabernacle in the book of Moses. We know the story well. God had delivered the Israelites out of Egypt. He had uh, he parted the Red Sea. The, uh, the Egyptians had been the Egyptians pursuing the Israelites had been drowned, and God had given to the Israelites uh, through Moses the Ten Commandments. And as we read Exodus, we have the description of how God instructed Moses to construct a tabernacle for him. So here we are, this is the tabernacle of the portable temple that God, uh, that was constructed. Uh, if any of the children uh, want to play cool this morning and they can't find one of the cues, then, uh, then uh, I've got hold of it. Uh, that's a shame. Huh? <laughs> but, uh, uh, anyway, so here's the tabernacle. It was... Uh, 150 feet long by 90 feet wide. Mm -hmm. You have the altar, the basin, and uh, the holy place for the bread of the presence, the golden lampstand, and the altar of incense. And then uh, up here, that's the most holy place uh, with the Ark of the Covenant. The significance of the tabernacle, the tabernacle literally means dwelling place. And the tabernacle, it was a sign, it was a visible, tangible sign to the Israelites that they were God's people with whom he would always be present. The end of the book of Exodus describes the glory of the Lord entering the tabernacle when the work was finished. Uh, Exodus 40 says, it says that he that's Moses, erected the court around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the tent of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. And then what happened next? The cloud, that's the glory of God, covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. 
and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The third temple that appears in scripture is the temple constructed by King Solomon. King David, that's Solomon's father, had a grand ambition to build a temple to the Lord his God. But God told David, through the prophet, prophet Nathan, that it would be his son Solomon who would build the temple. The temple was modelled on the tabernacle, it had an Ark of the Covenant at centre, and it was built around 950 BC, taking, taking seven years to complete. Um, it's interesting that Solomon spent about seven years constructing the the, the temple, but then I think he spent he spent about twenty years constructing a you know a nice grand house for himself. So he kind of somewhere along the line he, he got his priorities a little bit skewed. But nevertheless, Solomon constructed this this temple for the Lord. And then when the temple was complete, again God's majestic presence filled the place. Uh, and when the priest came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord. So that the priests could not minister, the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, because the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. This is what happened when, when Solomon dedicated the temple, the cloud and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. So again, the temple was the unique place where God dwelt amongst his people. Um, whizzing through the fourth temple in scripture is the temple rebuilt by Ezra and Zerubbabel following the, the, the return from exile. There we go. So that, that's the, that's the rebuilt temple. And uh, now it, uh, it's interesting reading the the narrative in the book of Ezra. Uh, it, it tells us that this this rebuilt temple, that this temple temple that was rebuilt after the exiles returned from Babylon, it was not as impressive as the first temple. Uh, Ezra three twelve tells us that many of the older priests and the Levites and the family heads who had seen former temple, that they wept aloud when they, when they saw the foundation of the new temple being laid. Basically because, you know, it, it, it wasn't as good, it wasn't as grand as the old temple. And the narrative also tells us that there was no appearance or display of the glory of the Lord in this rebuilt temple. I'm not saying that God wasn't present in his temple, but uh, that, there was no, that there was no display uh, of the appearance of the glory of the Lord in this new temple. So we're left pondering two questions. Well, first of all, will a new and a better temple appear in the future? And then secondly, will the glory of the Lord, the glory that appeared in the tabernacle in the wilderness, and the glory that appeared in Solomon's temple, will, will it ever appear again in his temple? The prophet Haggai, who was contemporary with Ezra, gives us a clue to the answers by speaking of a time in the future when the glory of the new temple will be greater than the glory of the former one. Haggai 2.9 says that the latter glory of this house, that's the temple, shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. So we've looked at four temples so far. What's the fifth temple that appears in scripture? Let's fast forward to the New Testament. Let's, forward to the, let's fast forward to the day of Pentecost and to the coming of the Holy Spirit. Oh, uh, next Sunday, by the way, the 5th of June, is Pentecost Sunday. So, so we'll be celebrating Pentecost then. And uh, Now, Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that, that's something, isn't it, that believers, and you know, in particular us, uh, charismatic, is something that we, we love, you know, the, you know, the yeah, great, fantastic, you know, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the, yeah, the gifts of the Spirit and vibrant worship and uh, fantastic uh, everything. But Pentecost has some, some significant theological implications. And uh, one of these is, is that Pentecost, uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the believers, is the dedication of, of a new temple. What was this new temple? It's not a building, not something constructed by man, but it, it's the church, it's the body of Christ. It's the community of believers in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. Acts, uh, the start of Acts chapter 2 says, uh, When the day of Pentecost arrived, 
they, that's, that's the believers, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And this sound filled the entire house <coughs> where they were sitting. This narrative parallels the descriptions in Exodus and Kings of the glory of the Lord's filling those temples, the tabernacle and the temple of Solomon, at their dedication. So Pentecost was the unveiling of a new temple, the glory of which shall, as Haggai said, it should be greater than the former temple. <coughs> I've got another image to show you on the screen. Have a look at the image and tell me if you recognise it. Kevin Beatty. We've got one. We've got one Ipswich Town fan. Does, does anybody else recognise that? Uh, no, Laura. Laura spots that. Yeah. Kevin Beatty. Yes, that, that's the statue uh, outside Portman Road of Kevin Beatty. And in December last year, the, the long-awaited statue of Kevin Beatty was unveiled. Um, Who was he? Uh, uh, he was part of the Ipswich Town team that won the FA Cup in 1978 and the UEFA Cup in 1989. Yes. <laughs> 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 the very first match I went to, he came up as a sub and his first touch of the ball scored a goal. Oh, nice. Amazing player. Okay. So, Kevin Beatty was arguably the greatest player uh, ever that's ever played for Ipswich Town. Uh, you can have debates about it. I mean, some would argue for Paul Mariner, um, others would argue for, for was it Ray Crawford? Ray Crawford, Ray Crawford. Ray Crawford. Uh, um, um, I mean, I, uh, my personal vote would be for Paul Mariner. Great story. Mick Mills? Mick Mills? Mick Mills, yeah. Okay. I think that the, 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 meet, the, the meeting has to send. The, the meeting has to send. I've, pro I've probably lost, uh, those of you that aren't in the football, I've probably lost you, so let, 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 let me pull it back. But where, are we, where are we going with it? So, so this was, oh, it's gone. There we go. There we go. So that, that, that's a statue of Kevin Be Beatty. And so December last year, uh, the covering from the statue was, was pulled back, and the image of Kevin Beatty was finally revealed. But something much greater, something much more wonderful happened at Pentecost 2,000 years ago. So the, the spiritual covering was pulled back and God's new temple was revealed. The, the believers in whom the Holy Spirit is revealed. <coughs> and uh, I just want to encourage all of you this morning, I just want to encourage myself and all of us that are in Christ this morning, that, that, <coughs> that, that we, are, we are bricks. Uh, we are bricks in this new temple there uh, in which God takes up residence and uh, as Ruth was quite rightly encouraging us this morning, we're, you know, we're, we're all important uh, to God. We're, we're all really important bricks in that temple. And for me, this is, this is just incredibly humbling. Uh, I do not deserve to be a part of God's temple. And, uh, I deserve to be rejected and thrown out. If, if you imagine the, the temple's here, and over here there's this, just this rubbish heap where all the reject stones are that's where I that's where that's where I deserve to be I mean I, I know my heart I, I know the things I've thought things I've said things I've done I, I know that I deserve to be crushed by the cornerstone but but God in his great mercy he's chosen me and all of us that are in Christ he's chosen all of us to be stones to be uh, bricks in, in his temple so we, we are uh, we here at King's Church, we, we are, how amazing it is, we're the temple of God. And, you know, as, as part of the worldwide body of church, we're part of that worldwide church, which is the temple of God. And let me make five points just to bring this into land. And the first one is that we're very much still a work in progress. So the, the, the statue of Kevin Beatty, that was, the statue of Kevin Beatty was, was a finished work. So it had been cast in bronze and it had been unveiled and there we are. It was, it was a finished work and we are still very much a work in progress. Um, we are growing, present tense, we are growing into a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you are being built together into a dwelling place for God. So we're very much still a work in progress. So it's God is still working in us, still refining in us. Uh, there's a 
there's a, you, you knew this was coming, didn't you? There's a song that we used to sing back in the day. Do you remember? Jesus, take me as I am. Eh? Yeah. Who remembers Jesus, take me as I am? Eh? Okay. It, it goes like this. Jesus, take me as I am. I can come no other way. Take me deeper into you. Make my flesh my melt away. And then it goes on. Make me like a precious stone. Crystal clear and finally honed. That, 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 that was beautiful. Uh, it, it carries on. The love of Jesus shining through. Give me, give me glory back to you. But you know, Make me and make us. Make, make us like precious stones. Make us crystal clear and finally honed. Let's make this part of our prayers. You know, let's pray, Father, just thank you that you are building your temple. Father, thank you that you have chosen me. Thank you you've chosen us to be part of the temple. Father, would you make me fit to be part of this structure, like a precious stone, crystal clear and finely honed. Um, if, you know, I mean, sometimes like me, you know, you, you want to pray, but you, you kind of you, you kind of don't know how to pray. You don't know what to pray. Well, that's a great prayer. You can pray for yourself and pray for your family and pray for the church family. Just to thank God that He's building us into a temple and to, to pray that God would would refine us, that he, that he would make us crystal clear and finally honed. So my second point is that the foundation of the church is the apostles and the prophets, and in practical terms, this means that the church is built upon the New Testament scriptures. And I would suggest that by extension, it means that the church is built, built on the complete canon of scripture, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The scriptures are the church's foundation documents, and just as a foundation cannot be tampered with once it's been laid, so the biblical foundations of the church are inviolable and cannot be changed by any additions, modifications, or subtractions. You probably noticed that, um, get my bearings right, I think the, the field over there, you probably noticed that Philip is building a new and a bigger barn. Eh? And uh, it's important that the field gets his foundation, gets that foundation of that barn right, eh? otherwise the structure will implode upon itself. So the, the foundations of the apostles and the prophets of Scripture are, are so important to us. And again, let me let me encourage myself. Let me encourage all of us. Let's let's be in the Word regularly. Let's let's commit ourselves to reading the Word individually and uh, as families. And you know, let's let's get along to life group where we can be in the Word. Um, I, I was talking to a brother yesterday, and uh, you know, he was telling me his his love for the Word, and that he will often uh, he, he'll go into his room and um, you know maybe spend like a couple of hours just just in prayer and really getting into getting deep into the word and it just that was such a challenge to me so let's let's commit ourselves to being regularly to feeding upon the word and then thirdly that christ is the cornerstone of the church that the cornerstone is of crucial importance to the building it holds the building steady and it keeps the building level we as the living bricks we need to be connected to the cornerstone and one way that God enables us to do this is through us breaking bread together. So we'll be taking communion, we'll be breaking bread uh, as part of this service. And as we eat bread and as we drink juice together in a few minutes, let's pray that God would nourish us. Let's pray that he would strengthen us. Let's pray that he will keep us steady and level in him. And then fourthly, one of the peculiar glories of the temple is that it's bricks from two different quarries that have been built side by side. In the first century, Jewish and Gentile believers were together, were forming the new community in which the living God was taking up residence. In our situation today, I mean, we're, we are, um, our situation, we're, we're predominantly uh, a Gentile community. I, I know we, we have some folk with Jewish uh, uh, Jewish lineage, but we are we, we are predominantly a, a Gentile community. Um, so uh, let's make sure that we're overcoming a, any other racial or cultural differences that we may encounter as we seek to grow <coughs> as a church. As we pray that God will add to our number, let's pray that we welcome 
anyone <coughs> that God sends to us, regardless of their cultural, ethnic, or other background. Let's not in any way hinder the beautiful temple that God has in mind for us. By <coughs> Let's not in any way hinder the beautiful temple that Paul has in mind from being built in the way that will honour one God of all the world. And then fifthly, as the temple of God, let's, uh, let's expect God's presence to be manifest with us. I thought it was lovely in our worship this morning, and in particular the latter part of the worship, where we, we, we were singing that, that song, uh, Majesty, that Ruth was leading us in. And I, I don't know about you, but I, I could sense the presence of God amongst us this morning. So uh, as, the, as the temple of God, let's expect... God to be present with us Sunday by Sunday, and let's let, let's pray for God's presence. You know, some, Sunday by Sunday, as we gather to worship, let's pray that God will manifest His glorious presence amongst us. Uh, so let's uh, let's pray now, Father. Father, just thank you, just thank you for that amazing, amazing privilege, Father, that that, that, that you have chosen us, Father, to be to, to be living stones in the temple. That, uh, that, that you are building. As the Lord Jesus said, he said, uh, destroy this temple and in, in three days I'll rise it, I'll, I'll raise it up again. And uh, he was speaking of his, his body, and, um, but he was also speaking figuratively of us as the, as the body of Christ. So Father, just, uh, just, just how, how amazing, how humbling it is, Father, that you have chosen each of us to be bricks in that temple, that, that, that temple that is still being built, we're still a work in progress. Father, would you continue to build us here, continue to build us, we pray, into a temple um, where, 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 where your name is honoured uh, and where your glory is evident. We pray this in Jesus' name.